Hello, my name is Jeremy Barnes, and today I'm going to do a review for Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. It will be non-spoiler for the first part of the review, but then I'll jump into some spoilers uh, at the end. So, he here's my overall thoughts of the movie. I think it was decent overall, but kind of lackluster as the movie that was supposed to introduce Kang the Conqueror, who was supposed to be the next big bad of the MCU. Um, in the same vein as Thanos was for what the Marvel Cinematic Universe called the Infinity Saga. And this current saga that we are on is called the Multiverse Saga. So Kang is supposed to be um, the Thanos of the Multiverse Saga. But this movie, in my opinion, didn't really set him up to be on the same level as Thanos. So in that regard, it was a little bit disappointing. Um... And I'll talk more about that as we get into like the characters and I just start discussing King. Um, but uh, I'll say as the third film in the Ant-Man franchise, this was better than the second movie, Ant-Man and the Wasp, which came out in 2018. Um, but not as good as the first one, which for me, the 2015 film is actually a classic Marvel movie. And the way that I define classic in the sense of MCU films is like kind of its own thing. It's it, it's doing its own thing as just a movie, um, and and it has a lot of heart with various elements that, in my opinion, good movies have, which is like uh, good drama, some sort of family dynamic, and or a romance, um, and that first M N movie had all of that, um, plus some really cool creative action. For the genre and I think just for films in general because there had obviously been films where people were able to shrink down or have shrunk down in the past but I think this movie kind of put that sort of filmmaking on, on a different level and um, and it just had a lot of heart which I feel like this one, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, didn't have really the same heart that that first one had. Um, or even the second one. Uh, but I, I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, now I'm going to just talk about the plot of the movie. I feel like this is a movie and it's kind of something that's been happening uh, more often recently with Marvel movies. That has no real story to it. And it's completely just plot focused, um, which is another reason why I, I don't like this one as much. And I haven't been liking a lot of the recent movies um, from Marvel as much as I had before. But the main arc of this movie is there's an uprising in the quantum realm against the tyrannical rule ruler of it. Um, and that ruler is Kang the Conqueror. And once the team gets there, um, they get kind of thrown into his plans to escape. Because they have something that would allow him to escape the quantum realm, which has been serving as his prison. So then it, it starts to become a little bit of like the prevention of his escape back into the, into the world or universes above. Um, and that's all I like fine and dandy as like set up for the next major Avengers movie. But I'm a big firm believer, even in the MCU, that all movies should be able to stand on their own. And should focus on telling a good story, which this movie did not have, in my opinion. Um, it could have been a story about a man who has lost so much time with his daughter throughout her life and for various reasons at at different points um who is only now trying to really make up for that time um and it seemed like that's what the movie was going to be from the trailer but that sort of element only becomes an afterthought in the movie which was super unfortunate to see and that's kind of where it lost a lot of that heart that the first and even the second movie had um so they didn't really get to di dive into that and that kind of goes to my next point, which is about the characters. This movie also was not character focused at all. 
except for maybe delving into King himself. And like, if that's the case, then he really is the lead of the film. But I feel like even then, they didn't really, they didn't really give him enough for him to actually have that title. Um, and we didn't really get to truly explore his character three dimensionally in this film, which was also like a huge disappointment, especially because I feel like. Uh, Jonathan Andrews' appearance as He Who Remains, a King variant in Loki season one, was more three-dimensional in, in just that one epi uh, episode appearance of him in, in that than in this entire movie. So because of that, I would say that uh, He Who Remains is actually my favorite version of King uh, so far, and even even still after this movie. Um, so, even though King was uh, very underwhelming, well, not very underwhelming, I think a little underwhelming in this movie, he does have still a lot of potential to become a better villain that is on the same level as Thanos. And I'm kind of, the way that I'm, I'm like thinking about it is that Thanos wasn't the big bad right away. He was teased at the end of the first Avengers movie, and then he had a more sizable, like, actual role um, as a kind of background character in Guardians of the Galaxy. And then uh, another kind of tease that was like kind of teeing him up for his actual big screen debut in all his glory in Infinity War. Um, and that was in the second Avengers movie. But it wasn't until Infinity War that we really got to see him as a, a, as a character with, with an arc. Um, so... That leaves like one small appearance and two kind of like cameos um, for Jonathan Majors to get to the same level. And so far, I would say that his appearance in Loki and now in this movie kind of ties um, back up to the same level of Thanos being a small character in Guardians and then the two cameos he was in. So on his next appearance, Kang needs to be like... A main character and and ha have a good arc to him and i i do think that will happen uh hopefully in loki season two but uh we'll see and i'll talk more about like some of that spoiler stuff um as i go into the, the end of my video i feel like king the conqueror the writing of his character was a little simple and it kind of made him come across uh, as like a mustache twirling villain, which Marvel has been good at not making villains like that. But I feel like Kang in this movie kind of does fall into that category. But I feel like Jonathan Majors did the best that he could to elevate the character with his performance. Um, and like beneath the surface of the writing of, of the, the, the dialogue he says, I think there is more going on that is a little bit more three-dimensional. But it, I, I think it does come all from the actor and not really the writing itself. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see more of Jonathan Majors as different versions of Kang and future projects. But here, like I said, he was mostly kind of underwhelming. Um, but now I'm going to talk about some of the other characters, starting with Ant-Man, since this franchise started with him. And I was still, I'll say that uh, Paul Rudd's performance of Scott Lang is still super charming and hilarious so there's not really much um kind of to say about that um because this movie is so so much like lacking a uh, character focus I would say like no character really has an arc except for like I said Kang um and what that arc is I'll, I'll say later in the spoiler section but Ant-Man, he kind of starts out and ends the movie pretty much like in the same place. Um, in the beginning, he kind of seems to be somewhat retired or like semi-retired as a hero. But when even when he ends the film and gets back to the to the real world, it's still he's still kind of in the same in the same boat. Um, 
And then the next character I'm going to talk about is Cassie Lang, Scott's daughter, who is now all grown up after we saw her after the time gap um, from Infinity War to Endgame. And she was recast in this movie um, as Catherine Newton, now playing her. And the way I would describe her character is that she's a bit of a brat who wants to do the right thing, but doesn't actually think about the consequences of her actions, even when there are good intentions behind it. Because even if you have good intentions, you could still make mistakes and lead to to more problems. Um, so she's kind of in that in that like middle zone where she wants to do the right thing, but sometimes makes mistakes and getting more people into trouble um, because she doesn't actually fully think about her actions before she takes them. Um, because of this, like I, I, I didn't really mind her character, but I feel like she's not as interesting or as fun as the younger Cassie was. Um, but similar to like Kane, I think there's room for her to grow, and I hope we do see some of that. Because this movie also didn't really have her character develop much either. I, I feel like she is more more conscious of the possibility of her actions causing more conflict. But we don't actually see that growth within this movie. Um, which for her maybe, maybe uh, makes, makes sense. Because she is still young and... and this movie kind of takes place, I think, over not that much uh, time. But um, the next character I'm going to talk about is the Wasp, uh, Hope Van Dyne. And I feel like in this movie, she was super sidelined, but she was decent when she was there. Um, I never really kind of like missed her having a bigger role necessarily but it was a little bit unfortunate that that she was so sidelined especially since she's still part of the title ant-man and the wasp quantumania that title really rang true in in the second film but i feel like here it could have just been called ant-man um quantumania and it wouldn't have really made a big difference um as for her mom, Janet Van Dyne, I would say that she was kind of the third main character after Scott and King, who were like one and two. And there was way more to her here than in, in the previous film, which was her first like real appearance. And her story, story kind of ties very closely with King's. And, and that, that part of the story was actually um, the more interesting side of it, in my opinion. And I wish they would have done more or like have it had a bigger focus on that. And like we saw in this film, uh, I would want to continue to see more of Janet in the future. And I, I think she could have a, a major role um, in the MCU going forward. It was kind of weird to me, though, that they didn't really show more of Janet's powers, which she clearly had in the last movie. Um, so that, that was kind of weird, but but maybe we'll, we will get to see more of that. Um, later on uh, but we'll see and then as for the other parents of Hope um, we get Hank Pym back of course and similarly to Janet I feel like he was given way more to do in this film um, especially in terms of action as the OG Ant-Man and, and that was really cool to see it, it wasn't like super prevalent so don't don't go into it if you haven't seen it thinking that but I was happy with, with what he did here and he didn't really get to do before. He's always just kind of been like the mentor figure in the back, but he, he never was able to get his own hand, hands dirty in the present day. Um, but we did get to see a little bit more of that here. So that was pretty cool. I really liked his uh, relationship with Janet as husband and wife. Um, this movie also had the introduction of MODOK, um, the mechanized organism designed only for killing. 
and he, he's a bit of a goofy character from the comics, um, but but also kind of a, a main villain who kind of arcs over many different projects, I think. Um, and I've seen him in a few things now. Uh, I saw him in the Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes cartoon, as well as in his own uh, series for the um, Adult Swim uh, sort of animation style that uh, Patton Oswalt um, was part of, and he, he was the one who voiced MODOK in that show. And both of those appearances, I think especially the MODOK show itself, was really cool. Um, but in both of them, MODOK is kind of a silly character, goofy character. Uh, but at the same time, he could be like menacing and, and definitely a threat. And I feel like um, on that note, the character was a bit of a, a success in this film. Because he was funny, as he should be. He was really funny, actually. Um, but also, there's kind of like a, a darkness that is a bit kind of... Um, veiled by by his, like... The way that he portrays himself in MODOK. Um, where you kind of feel sorry for him. Um... But I feel like the thing that it was lacking a little bit is, is like, that in this film he seemed a little bit too small of a character, or too small-minded um, as a character, in terms of his motivations, which is not the case with Modoc in the other versions. He always has, like, grand ambitions, and he is, like, a genius. Um, but here, we didn't really get that side, and he was more of a lackey to King. Which is not what I imagine Modoc being. Um, and him being small was it's kind of funny considering his, his big head, uh, which is kind of the, the running joke of Modoc. Um, but I think the design was good, and I'll talk more about that when I talk about the costumes. Um, and then there were a, a few other like minor characters in this film as well that were like freedom fighters fighting against King. And his rule. Uh, the leader of the group was named Jintora, and I feel like she was pretty cool overall. Um, I feel like her kind of second in command. Um, his name was Quaz, and he was a, a telepath. And I feel like he he was pretty funny and very useful for the group. Um, but I kind of wish he had a little bit more to do in this movie. Um, and I would be down to see more of all of these characters uh, later and in the future. And I think in the comics, like, Gentora is, is part of a team called the Micronauts. Because um, they're like explorers or, or people that go around the microverse, which is what the quantum realm is in the MCU for, for that comic book counterpart. Um, so I feel like they could kind of make their own little team and have maybe like a show or something with them later but uh we'll see I, I i'd definitely be down for it um but yeah and then there was also this other other creature that was kind of like a a gelatin creature like a jello type of thing in terms of how he moves and stuff and his name was veb and i think i thought he was hilarious and, and very heartwarming he was actually voiced by David Desmalchion, who was the actor who played Kurt in the previous two Ant-Man movies. And he, nor Luis, or any of the gang from the ex-cons showed up in this movie, unfortunately. But at least uh, David Desmalchion was able to voice Veb in this one uh, as somebody or a creature from the Quantum Realm. And then the last, like, real character from the Freedom Fighter group was uh, Zalem, with the X. And he was a dude from the trailer who has, like, kind of this circular head, um, which is able to shoot out, like, kind of like a laser beam from it. And I feel like he was a badass and probably my favorite of the group. Um, but Luis was definitely missed in this movie. I didn't really need to see any of the other um, characters from the X-Cons, but Luis being Scott's best friend, 
I feel like should have at least showed up in the beginning and or the end of the film. Um, and they didn't even mention him, so that was kind of kind of weird to me. And uh, I do wish he was part of that because I think he also added a lot of that heart in the first movies. But um, neither of them were in there, nor Cassie's mom and her her new husband or boyfriend uh, was in it either. So I feel like that definitely had a big effect on it really kind of landing as an Ant-Man movie. As like the third film in that franchise. But. Anyway. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the costumes. And I'm going to start with the best one. Which was King the Conqueror. And his costume was excellent. And I'd even say it was, it was perfect. Ripped straight out of the comics. But also very real. And looks. It, it looks fucking cool. Um, and super like regal. With the metallic armor and all that. Um, but also kind of comfortable. Um, doesn't look like too heavy. Um, probably heavier than the Black Panther costume, but, but not as heavy as like an Iron Man armor. Uh, so somewhere in between. And then the Wasp, I think, might have had her best costume yet. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if it's for sure my favorite, because I think I might have liked the design of, of her. Ant-Man and the Wasp costume, but I think the reason why this one might be my favorite is because the colors pop a lot more, and, and she's like clearly the Wasp, even like from far away, you could tell like, oh, like I see her, um, and like the vibrancy of it, it is really good, and it also adds when there's like a lot of action going on within the quantum realm, which is a very colorful place, that we could actually kind of follow her and see her, even when she is in her tiny form flying around. Because she has this like kind of yellow glow that she creates when she flies. Similar to like a, a lightning bug would. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And then Ant-Man's costume in this movie I think was decent. But a bit of a downgrade in my opinion from his previous few suits. I feel like in Endgame he probably had the same suit that he did in the second movie. And I think that one might have been the best one. Um, I think it was only a little bit different from Civil War, which was also a really good suit. Um, but yeah, I think that probably is my favorite Ant-Man, um, costume. And then, uh, Cassie gets her own costume in this movie as well. Um, I don't, they don't really give her an official name in terms of, like, her, like, superhero name of what that costume is supposed to, like, represent. Um, but in the comics, she's called Stinger when she wears this purple costume as, like, a, a little shrinking person. Um, but then she also has another alias uh, called Stature when she, she's this, like, she grows big. And she does both in this movie, so it could go either way. Um, and her costume, I think, I would say is good. Uh, it wasn't anything that like blew, blew me away or anything but it fits nicely with the Ant-Man and Wasp costume <laughs> and then Modoc, like I said I think he had a great design especially when he was fully armored because I think that version of it uh, I think matches more closely to the comics with his kind of like mean mug face because he's supposed to look kind of like menacing when he has his armor on but when he puts it off, it, it's just it's just like a human face, except just like kind of whiter. And I feel like his face design could have been better. Uh, like it could have been more manipulated and like kind of ugly and like kind of gritty um, with whatever happened to him in the quantum realm. Like it could have been damaged in some way. But it was just Baron Cross's face, just like I said, whiter to fit this fucking uh, floating body contraption that he has but uh i feel like overall it was decent though i think some shots look better than others uh, i feel like mostly it looked good but some sometimes it, it looked kind of weird um and him him just kind of having a regular face i feel like he looks a little too nice for somebody whose whose bones were like crushed and like broken down where he just has 
two tiny arms and tiny legs on this like hover chair that he's on and his body was like physically distorted so much and left stranded in the harsh alien world of the quantum world that like I, I don't buy him being so fucking nice and like actually like kind of smiley as Modoc. Um but it kind of fits in with the like humor humorous side of him. So I, I didn't mind too much, but I feel like if they would have made him look a little meaner or angrier, it would have been even better. Um and the best thing that I could think of that would have probably been pretty similar is the way that Modoc looked in the Avengers video game. Um but overall, I, I still liked his design. Um, uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about, which I don't think I've ever really talked about in a review, is is the editing. And the only reason to talk about the editing is when it's not good. Because editing is good when you don't notice it. But in this movie, I did notice it. So I feel like the editing was bad in this film. It wasn't terrible. Like kind of the story structure of Eternals, which a lot of people had a uh, big problem with. I, I didn't mind it, um, but I think that's different from editing. Editing is like literally from one scene to the next, how it's cut together. Um, and the reason why I noticed it is because some scenes were obviously cut down, where like there was more going on originally when they filmed it, um, but they cut a lot of it out and and because of that the flow from one section to another was kind of choppy to me and that's why like i noticed it i was like like that was kind of weird it seemed like something else was about to be said but but they don't say it because they, they moved to something else and um a little bit with kind of the structure the editing structure it's not really the story structure of it like eternals but um even like the marvel studios intro was kind of oddly placed for me <clears throat> um that's what started the movie and then they had a seemingly kind of random intro of king as he arrives into the quantum realm and and he meets janet who was already there but we don't really know who he is like a, as like a general audience who, who has no idea what what's going on in the wider mcu like, we don't know who this dude is, so it, it, that's why it seems kind of random. And then it cuts to, like, the real uh, beginning of the movie, like, the prologue with Scott. I feel like the way that they should have done it, if they were going to have that be the beginning, is have the intro in the quantum realm first. And it, it kind of ends on, on, like, Kang asking, like, what is this place? And they could have had, like, a... Uh, a bigger view of the wider quantum realm and then cut to the Marvel Studios intro and then after that start the movie um with with Scott and back in the in the regular world and the modern modern day um but they didn't do it like that so it was like I don't know if we needed that scene a uh, similar problem that I could think of actually to this was um in Far From Home the second Spider-Man movie in the MCU where they had an intro of the villain there, um, Mysterio, and then they cut. But that one actually did cut um, in the same order that I just said, but but even that one was like kind of weird because, like I, like I said, it, it just felt kind of weird as as, an, as a beginning of the movie. Um, but it would have felt a little bit more in the right place if, Janet and Kane's journey was the main focus of the movie, but it ends up not being so. Um, a couple of parts that I that I'm thinking of specifically when I when I'm saying like I notice how the scenes were kind of cut down is uh, one time when Ant Man, Hank, and a few others are like kind of planning on what to do about the situation with Kane. And and they're just like discussing, but then it but then it like kind of ends the scene. And then another time is when uh, Janet is talking with King in his like throne room or whatever, and uh, he's kind of telling her about 
his plans and like why he needs to get out. Um, but that's all I'm gonna say right now, and I I can't like give you specifics because I don't have the movie to like refer to. Um, but those are the scenes that I that I'm thinking about. The next section is the action. Um, I feel like the hand to hand combat was kind of lame in this movie. And I feel like that was actually one of the cool things about both of the previous Ant Man movies. Um, they did really cool things with like the shrinking and stuff and the powers of Ant Man. Um, where here they didn't really do that much in, in that regard. So it was it was a little lame because of that. But I feel like they did have some cool set pieces. Um Modoc's entrance was kind of one of them, and I think that was kind of cool. It could have been a little bit more intimidating if we actually saw him like just murdering people, where I, I don't think he, he did. He was just kind of destroying buildings and stuff. Oh, actually, he did kill a few people, but um, I don't know. I feel like it just happened a little bit too quick for it to be uh, as big of a moment as it could have been. The next uh, set piece was what they call the probability storm, which we see in the trailer is when uh, Scott kind of like starts duplicating. Um, and, and it's called the probability storm because those duplicates are like um, potential other versions of him if he made, made a different decision in the moment. Um, so that part was really fucking cool. Like that was one of my favorite parts of the movie. Um, because it kind of ties to the time aspect that the quantum realm, like, things don't work the same as they do up here. Um, and in the moment, he sees all of his different uh, potential outcomes. And they are, like, physical things. Like, he could actually, um, you know, collaborate with them and, like, actually touch the other versions of him so that they could, like, throw each other up or whatever um and then it's cool because they end up working as as like an ant colony he's ant-man and they all like kind of lift him up to form like a tower like how we saw them use uh, with the ants in the first film um but they use uh just a bunch of scots lifting scott up instead of a bunch of ants lifting him up and that that was really fucking cool and it, it adds to a lot of like the visual elements that are really awesome in the movie um especially when like wasp comes in to kind of help him after he starts falling down and she grabs his hand and like pulls him back up and and it's like a it's almost like like a mirror or or like a trail and in the trailer I, I, at first i thought that was just like her shrinking down um because that's kind of the the visual language that they use for for that um, which is similar to the comics, how they kind of like draw the outlines when they're shrinking up or down. Um, but it was actually just a bunch of like different versions of her as like kind of the ghosts. Um, that's another way I, I, I kind of think about it too. Um, so all of that shit was really fucking cool. Um, and then the next like major action sequence was the ambush on King's Cit Citadel. Um, at the end of the movie, it's kind of like the third act um, thing, where we see Giant Man in the movie, and that's when we see Cassie also um, become stature. And that one was, was decent. It kind of served its purpose, but it wasn't really like a standout scene in the movie or, or in the MCU uh, overall. Um, but that kind of ends with something else where this is when like Hank uses his, his Ant-Man OG skill set and he actually calls in a bunch of ants that also went into the quantum realm when the, the crew did and they all storm in and kind of uh, serve as like a last line of defense against uh, King when he starts kind of pushing the, the um, Berlin back. By force and they come in and that shit was really cool and some of them are like are like big and then a lot of them are just kind of like why well, I think all of them are actually kind of like larger than the regular sized people and at that level of the quantum realm 
but then there's the one like massive one too and so that shit was really cool and kind of crazy and Hank's the one that calls them in so that's why I, I kind of said he, he gets in on the action a little bit the last fight where it's like a hand-to-hand -hand combat of uh, Scott versus King that we also saw in the trailer that one was also like decent it was mostly Ant-Man just getting his ass kicked um, but the way it ends is obviously kind of spoilerish, so I'll, I'll talk more about it a little bit later. The next section I'm going to talk about are the visual effects, and I feel like they were pretty good in this movie. Like I said uh, previously, Modoc looked a little wonky sometimes, and and I think that had to do with the visual effects a little bit. Um, some of the ant-sized action also looked kind of funny when when the characters would shrink down. The thing that this movie did differently from the other movies is that in the other movies we were like the camera was at their level when they were small. I forgot what they called it, but it was like a, a micro view or like macro photography. I think macro photography because things that normally look normal looked way bigger in that in that form of shooting. Um, here we didn't get that view. We got the view of like a regular sized person looking at the tiny little person there. So because of that, when when like they were like running or something in that in that form, it, it reminded me of like toys and Toy Story. So it like it looked kind of fake, like it didn't look real. Um it looked like just like a little action figure like running. Um so that kind of was weird. And um and because of that, it wasn't as cool or like creative as the, the previous movies were when the way they, they shot it. Um, and then the last like major thing having to do with the visual effects is the quantum realm itself, or the, the, the design of it and all that. And I feel like it looked cool, but also very cartoony. And because of that, not really believable. And the closest thing I could actually think of that kind of reminded me of this was a recent Disney movie, um, animated movie, Strange World. But in that one, the visuals actually looked like cool because it, it fit like the style of animation better than here where like it just looked, it just looked fake. Like you just don't believe it because it's supposed to be like a real setting, but it, it just gave off a very non-real aesthetic to me um, and it also was not as cool as the quantum realm looked previously in, in any of the other two movies either and, and those ones it did look real it looked very weird like very kind of um, trippy but very real like it looked like a place like this would probably be like this where, where there's a bunch of patterns and kind of like reflections of um, where everything was kind of symmetrical and like weird just kind of formations of things going in and out and stuff and as like Scott went into like different levels of it it had like slightly different visuals but here it was literally like a world and it wasn't like how those other glimpses of the quantum realm were. And Hank even mentions that when he gets there again, because he went in the last movie. Um, I just kind of wish they would have had some of those elements still present here. Even if they did make it more, a little bit kind of more like a, a world within a world. Um, the closest thing was that like probability storm that we saw. But... That one was kind of like another separate section. And I feel like the probability storm wasn't really the quantum realm itself. It was more a consequence of the device that was like that King was trying to access by sending Scott down there. And it was a like multiversal engine core. So I think that's what created all these kind of like variants, like real time variants. Of Scott because it literally is part of the multiverse so it was creating other versions of him in the moment but um, 
overall, I mean, I didn't mind it too much, but I was kind of missing a lot of the things from the previous movies that was not in this one. Um, but that's all I'm going to say about my non-spoiler section of the review. So now I'm going to talk about spoilers. Um, and I'm going to start first with Modoc. And I'll say that I was accepting of his backstory. Um, the way that he became MODOK was he was Darren Cross and from the first movie, Yellow Jacket. And Ant-Man like sabotaged the back of his suit, causing him to shrink down. But as he was shrinking, like he was kind of like imploding in on himself. And that's why his like kind of bones cracked as he went into the quantum realm. And that's what kind of made him the little MODOK thing with the little arms and legs. And then just this massive head, because that was the last part of him that kind of shrunk. Um, and I'll say that I liked him more here than I did um, as in his appearance as Yellow Jacket. But I feel like he was less scary. Like, I feel like he actually was more intimidating as Yellow Jacket in the first Ant-Man movie. Um, and it's probably because they kind of make a joke out of him here. Whereas we were supposed to take... Darren seriously in, in the first one. Um, but I don't know. I think he's just more of an interesting character as somebody that's kind of goofy. I wish they added some more of that that like menace to him that he did have in, in the first movie. Um, and I think that would have made him like the perfect MODOK. But they kind of took some of that away for the sake of humor. Um, but at the end of the movie, he kind of like makes a decision to go against King. Um, so then King like basically kicks his ass and he's like beat so bad that his little heart monitor that he has on his suit flatlines. So he seems to have died and probably for good since we already thought he died kind of um, from the first movie. Um... So that's kind of unfortunate because I thought MODOK was going to be somebody who would carry on after this movie into some other Marvel projects. I thought he would escape the quantum realm and become a threat in, in the main world. But it seems like that's not the case because even if he didn't die, he's still in the quantum realm. But I, I feel like that's it for him. He's just, he's just that one, one and done appearance. So that, that kind of sucked. But the fight with Ant-Man and Kang... It ends by, uh, this is like after the ants storm in, and, and the ants actually take uh, a lot of King's armor apart and leave him uh, kind of a little bit beat up. And the crew hijack uh, some of the engine core from King's uh, ship, and they use it to open up a portal back to the, the main universe of Earth. And a lot of them jump in, but then King comes out of nowhere and, and he, he tries to jump through. But Ant-Man stops him, and he's the only one that's like left in the Quantum Realm. And that's kind of when they're like fighting. Um, but uh, after King beats up Ant-Man, uh, Wasp jumps back in and helps him to keep, keep King back. And the door like kind of closes on them. And, and they like blast him into his engine core. And because of how like unstable it is, like you can't really do much damage to it or else it could cause like catastrophic um, problem. And it ends up kind of sucking King into it where he like shrinks down in a similar way to Darren Cross did in the first Ant-Man movie. Uh, but it seemingly kills him. And we kind of get the confirmation of that from the post credit scene where we see some other versions of King and they say, oh, like the Earthlings, the Avengers or whatever, uh, killed the, the banished one or whatever they call them, um, the exiled one. And uh, on one hand, if, if that is what happened, it's okay. But on the other hand, I feel like if he was going to be taken out and, like, killed in this movie, 
he should have at least taken out one of the ant family before he died and that's kind of i think another reason why this movie doesn't really hit as like the big game changer that it was set up to kind of be and like the start of, of phase five and and the real like intro of king and the multiverse saga because he, he didn't kill nobody and he got taken out by ant-man of all people so it kind of really makes him not seem as threatening as as he's supposed to be um so i don't know that was that was kind of crazy if he at least took somebody out with him i think it would have been a little bit more like i would have been more accepting of his fate but i feel like it was they kind of just wasted him a little bit and maybe he was never supposed to be the main villain of the next avengers movie like like i thought and maybe it's one of these other kings or just the king dynasty as they call it the whole council of kings all together they are the villains of the king dynasty movie um but i always thought it was the king dynasty as in like he is in charge king the conqueror that version of king but i don't know and we'll see maybe he he's not dead maybe they think he's dead but but he's just like hiding somewhere or he's went to a, another realm or another state of being and maybe he's gonna have even more abilities from that experience uh, in the future but um as for the post credit scenes themselves i feel like none of them really excited me for the future but um that one with the three that were saying like oh they they killed the exiled one it was cool at least seeing the many different versions of king and especially those three who seem to be like the leaders of the council of kings um and the three that were there were um immortus who was like the king like king kind of it seems like he's like the ruler ruler of, of all of them he seems to be the one on top and then they had pharaoh ramatat the egyptian ruler king from when he goes back to that time period um and then somebody else who uh, a lot of like youtubers think is supposed to be centurion who in the comics was called scarlet centurion because he wore red but here he's not red he's just like kind of a metallic like armor that he wears and like a purple kind of energy flow from within uh i, I don't know who he's supposed to be exactly but that's who they're saying um out of those three the most the one i'm most excited to see is pharaoh ramatut and i hope we see him in moon knight season two i hope they use that to tie in moon knight a little bit more into the broader mcu and i think that would be a, a cool villain for him to face since it is egyptian based but also like i said ties into the, the wider mcu um and then they had a another post credit scene at the end which i believe is an actual scene from Loki season two and we saw yet another version of King this time Victor Tiny um, and he seems to be like I don't know what time period exactly it is but it, it does seem like kind of old like either early on after the invention of like lights and light bulbs and stuff or electricity the discovery of electricity and he's like building a machine that is like supposed to be like a time machine of some sort um in that time period and uh, and that is cool and i am excited to see this version of king in loki season two but um this scene alone obviously didn't give us much but uh i am excited for loki season two because season one was amazing and it also had my favorite version of king so far with he who remains so I'm excited to see what they do here where I'm sure Victor Timely is going to be a, a main character of the season. He's not going to just show up at the end like he who remains did in season one. So I am really excited about that. But that's really all I have to say about the movie. There's not much, much to it. Um, overall, I liked it and I feel like I wasn't as disappointed with this one as I was with Multiverse of Madness. But also it might be because my expectations going into it were a lot smaller because it's the same director that did ant-man and the wasp which is one of my like 
le- like least favorite MCU movies and definitely one of my um least favorite sequels. I was hoping he would be able to pull off something big with this one, but I I don't think it ended up working. Um, the reason why I had some faith was because he he directed what is arguably the best episode of The Mandalorian when Luke returned at the end of season two. Um, and that whole episode was really cool. But um, I don't know. This one, it just seemed like another Ant-Man movie to me. Um, and not even one of the best ones. So Overall, it was decent. I, I think I would give it an 8.5 out of 10. Um, maybe even lower like an 8 out of 10 um i think i enjoyed it enough to not give it something like a 7.5 so 8 or 8.5 right now i'm going with 8.5 but could be lower i don't know but yeah that's all i'm gonna say for now i'll have more thoughts about king and his future when we do get loki season two which is supposed to be in the summer hopefully around my birthday in July, but if you watch it, I hope you enjoy it, either as much as I did, or even more, um, I know the kind of consensus has been mostly kind of negative from critics, but pretty positive, I think, from fans overall, so thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time, peace.